I actually remember about 30 years ago, I watched a movie and uh, one of the lines in the movie was something that stuck out to me. And it was, there was a man who was so furious and angry. He was just staring off with just this horrible uh, grimace look on his face. And another guy walked by and said, you know, that anger is going to burn you up. And he says, yeah, but it keeps me warm. And I got that. And that was like many, so many years ago, but it keeps me warm. And that's what it was like for me on a good day and on a bad day, it ate me up. It's that bitterness that sits inside you that is uh, just dangerous. And with it there, you can't just act it away. You can't just manage your behavior uh, and just act it away. And I wanted it out so badly that I got on my face and I begged God to rip it out from the root. Just, I don't care what came with it, but I couldn't live like this anymore because it is, um, it's, a, it's, it's like a cancer inside you. It just spreads. As a Christian, God has um, continued to heal me in areas that were really, really deep. I've been, I am being healed. I am in the process of being healed. I won't stop until I don't, this doesn't own me anymore. It is like uh, being addicted to something. There is an incredible future ahead of me um, in freedom. So what is the dream life? Pastor Sean kicked off this series on Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, this small little letter found in the New Testament, written to real people in a real time and a real place. And Pastor Sean showed some different pictures behind him of, you know, is, is the dream life uh, enjoying a great sporting event with friends? Is the dream life going off on an adventure and hiking and climbing and seeing the world? Is the dream life a quiet garden with friends and a cup of tea? Is the dream life, is the dream life kind of having the right things? And, and what, what is it that makes life a dream life. And all those things that Pastor Sean talked about are not bad things. Those are good things. They'll give you, they'll give you a, nice, a nice life. But the dream life is more than having the right things and going to the right places and having the right experiences. The dream life is becoming the right person. Becoming who God has designed you to be. Looking in the mirror and saying, you know, that's someone that God delights in because you're being transformed by the presence of God. And in the book of Ephesians, like in many of the, the letters in the New Testament, there's kind of two parts to them. They often start with, here's the right way to live, what the, what the theologians would call, or, you know, uh, I'm sorry, here's the right way to believe, here's the right way to kind of think and believe, and, and you would call it orthodoxy, the right thinking, the right believing, and then it would move into, here's the right way to live, orthopraxy. How do, what's the, what, so right Thinking right belief leads to right living. And that means that when a person comes to the cross, meets Jesus, and becomes a follower of Jesus, becomes a Christian, they confess their sins, they receive the payment of Jesus on the cross, they become his follower, brace yourselves, things change. Your, your life changes when that happens. But it would, it would be wonderful if the moment you became a Christian, everything changed automatically. I became a Christian when I was 15. And it was amazing. That day I became a Christian. I grew up in a non-believing home, never held a Bible before. But that moment I became a Christian, I became perfected. No, I didn't. I've been a Christian for over 40 years, and I'm still not. I'm made right in Jesus, but I still have issues. I still have challenges. So here in Ephesians chapter 4, what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's kind of saying, okay, so now out with the old and in with the new. Get rid of some stuff and take on some new things. Let your life be transformed by the presence and the power of Jesus. And so this passage, it won't be on the screen, so I just want you to listen to this. This is Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 22. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians 4, your Bible apps, and you can go to Ephesians 4. But listen to these couple of verses, verse 22 and following. The Apostle Paul says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, who you used to be, to put off the old self, out with the old, put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, new in your thinking, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, that's who you were, 
but kind of out with the old. This is who you're becoming in with the new. Now, listen closely to these words. That's a lifelong process. It's an ongoing journey of growth in Christ. When you become a Christian, he makes you right. He makes you holy. You'll stand before God and you'll be seen as sinless because Jesus paid the price. No question. But in this life, we're growing to become more and more like Jesus. And the dream life is a life that's, that's consumed with that journey of becoming more and more like Jesus. And one aspect of that is kind of out with anger and in with peace. One of the things the Apostle Paul addresses in Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at that passage about four or five times. You're going to, get, you're going to kind of get the rhythm and the sound of that passage in your ears and in your heart and hopefully in your life. But that's one of the, one of the things that happens is, is Jesus says, okay, if you're my follower, you're going to become like me. So out with all that, that anger that wells up inside of you and that leads you to thoughts you shouldn't think and the anger that leads you to things you shouldn't say and the anger that leads you to do the things you shouldn't be doing, that anger that leads to sin in your life and damaging your own life and the lives of others. Leave that behind and learn to walk in peace. So, so a question. Does anyone dream about a life consumed with anger? Does anyone just think, oh man, that's, what, what's your goals? What's your dream for life? Oh, I want to be an angry person. <laughs> I mean, I wanna, if I get married someday... I want, to, every, I, want to, I want to see us yell at each other. I want to get so mad at my spouse, we won't even talk for like days on end. I just want anger to consume my marriage. And if I have kids, I want them fighting each other and fighting with us as parents and fighting with their neighbors. I just want to, I want to raise angry kids. And who dreams of that, right? Well, what, what, what's your dream? Or oh, in the workplace, I want to make sure I get along with nobody. I'm always in conflict and there's always tension. And that's, that's my dream, right? No, nobody dreams of an we seem to find our way into anger, but we don't dream of it. What we long for, what we dream of, is what God wants for us. Peace. We dream that if we're in a marriage relationship, we actually would get along. I mean, not see the world always the same. God's made us different and not agree on everything all the time. That's not realistic, but peace in our home and in that relationship that we understand each other. We understand our differences and our similarities and, and, and to watch our kids get along with each other and with their friends and with their family and with the world around them. To have peace. To go into a workplace and say, I like being here. It just feels right. There's a peace in the air. There's kind of a, we, we long for that. And what God says in this passage is that that's what he longs for us too. And that goes deeper than going on a nice trip somewhere. It goes deeper than sitting by the ocean or getting a good wave or hitting a nice golf shot. It goes, it's, the dream's bigger than that. It's becoming the people that God truly wants us to see. All of us long for a life saturated with peace. So look with me at Ephesians chapter four. I'm gonna begin in verse 25. I'm gonna read through verse 28. And here's what I want you to notice as I'm reading this passage. And as you follow along on the screen or in your Bibles or if you're at home on your Bible app in your Bibles, I want you to notice there's actually three topics that come up in this one little passage. And in every case, there's this picture of out with this and in with this. We're going to look at the middle of these three today, but I want you to see this rhythm of God's desire for us to leave some stuff behind, to be out with some things and to take some things on and to move towards the kind of life he has designed for us. And so in Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse 25, and that verse is the first kind of out with, in with. Here, here it is. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for you're all members of one body. Off with, out with, falsehood, in with truth. So don't tell lies. Don't speak falsely. Speak the truth. That's the first contrast, right? That, the transformation. Then you continue on, verses 26 and 27. Here's where we're going to focus today. In your anger... Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Pretty serious stuff. Out with anger and in with a lifestyle that deals with it, that fights against it, that doesn't let it linger and stay, that doesn't let the enemy have a place in your heart to use anger to lead you into sin. That's the second contrast. Here's the third one. This one's powerful, verse 28. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, out with that, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. That's radical. The thief becomes a generous person. Isn't that crazy? It says, out with stealing, but work hard and then share with other people. Here's the picture. 
When Jesus comes into your life, when you start to follow him, your life begins to be transformed. It doesn't happen like that. I wish it did. I wish like the day I became a Christian, poof, everything was perfect. Didn't work that way. Matter of fact, I've never met anybody at work that way for It's a journey of growth, becoming more and more like Jesus. But today we're going to focus on that second one, which is so, so important. We're going to focus on this issue of anger. And I know there's probably only a few people here that ever deal with anger. Most of you are really like peaceful. People never have any anger. But maybe God has something to say to you, even if you're not sure if you really are a person that deals with anger. So God, this is our prayer, that we with humble hearts and open ears would hear what you have to say. God, you offer us the dream life. And we can get consumed in a life stewing in anger and bitterness and conflict. And you offer us peace. Show us how to walk that path of peace this day, we pray, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. So, I want you just to think about these words. You know, and I'm going I'm to read them. Just listen to these words. In your anger, when you're angry, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Deal with it. When? Today. All right? And do not give the devil a foothold. Do you understand that when when anger lingers in your heart, when it simmers in your heart, and eventually comes out as sin, that gives the devil a little hook, a little foothold in your life. And there's a serious warning to be careful of that, to watch out for that. So the way it was, or maybe still is, anger has many faces. So, well, before I was a Christian, sometimes I dealt with anger. Now that I'm a Christian, I don't anymore. Well, maybe you do. Some of you are not yet followers of Jesus. Some of you are trying to figure out the whole God thing, church thing, Jesus thing. Shoreline's a great place to do that because you can hang out. We love you right where you're at, and there's free donuts. And so, and if you're online, if you come here, there's donuts. If not, buy your own donut and enjoy it while you're listening to the sermon and the music. But, um, but, But this is a place where you can come as you are and kind of learn more about Jesus. But even if you're a follower of Jesus, some people will say, you know, anger's not my issue. You know, I've met people that are angry. I mean, that, you know, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm not that. But, but here's the reality. There's, there's lots of kinds of anger. When I was a little kid, we used to go, my parents would take us to Baskin Robbins, like, like once a year. We'd go to Baskin Robbins. Baskin Robbins had how many flavors back in the day? 31 flavors. Maybe they still do. I haven't been there in a while, but they, they have 31 flavors, right? Well, anger doesn't just have one face. Anger has many faces, many expressions. I'm going to give you five pictures of anger. And I want you to ask yourself, could that maybe be me? Before you're quick to go, oh, it's my spouse that has an anger issue, it's my neighbor, it's my boss. Before you point to someone else, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart, okay? Maybe there's a face of anger that reflects what happens inside of you that you need to watch out for to make sure it doesn't lead you to sin and give a foothold to the devil and mess your life up and take away the peace God wants to give you. So there's explosive and eruptive anger. There's the spit-flying veins bulging, physically excited kind of anger. The face might look something like this face here, okay? The truth, you can't handle the truth. You mess with the wrong soldier. I don't know if you've seen the movie or not, but it's pretty intense. But that, some people's anger is just the, I mean, they wear, their, their face turns red. They, you see it, you see it, they see it, everyone knows it. Explosive, we go, oh, that's anger. I mean, that's anger. That's not me. I'm not that. Well, maybe some of you are going, that's me. Okay, then let God speak to you. But some of you, that's not me. How about this? How about this kind of anger? Locked in and locked up anger. Look at this face. Locked in and locked up anger. (laughs) Dr. Leo Marvin. Not angry. That's great. I'm fine. It's great. Happy for Bob. You know, it's it's all cool. And there's, there's that on the outside you know, but underneath that thin veneer of calm is a churning thing going on. Some of you go, I don't ever get angry. What you mean is I never explode. But there's stuff inside of you that you have to be aware of. And maybe, maybe that's your face of anger. How about this calculated, retaliation-driven anger? How about this face? How about this face? I'm not going to do anything. But... Uh, You'll get yours. <laughs> it's coming around. You won't see it coming, but when it comes, you'll know it. All right? And there, there's, there's, that, there's that. You don't explode, but it's in there, and you're plotting and you're planning, and you're going you're gonna to get your pound of flesh. You're gonna get, I mean, you go, oh, really? Yeah, in our minds. You said that about me. You did that to me. You just wait. 
it's coming, right? There's different faces of anger. There's passive aggressive anger. Now this might not look like an angry face, but uh, here's, here, look at this face here. There's passive aggressive anger. And this face uh, behind those eyes lies a raging, murderous, angry heart. Um, there's, t- there's times where it's just like, oh, no, that's nothing. There's nothing there. But, but the passive, there, there's people who will swear they're not angry. But they're just jabbing all the time. And there are little subtle ways. It's that passive, aggressive anger. And then how about this? Spiritualized attacks as camouflaged anger. Can, what about people who use faith and religion to unleash their anger, but they're just sweet as can be. Check out this face. What about this face? <laughs> We're not special, right? Well, bless, well, bless your little heart, right? And people who wrap their spirituality, they kind of use it as a, as a cover for their anger. And, and let me be clear. There's righteous anger. There's times where we should be righteously angry about things, but most of the time we think we're being righteously angry. It's probably not that. It's probably just our anger. And we're kind of dealing with it in our own way. There's lots of faces of anger. And what we need to do is we need to be able to, to pause and not quickly say, I don't deal with anger, but to say, maybe what's the kind of anger I might deal with? Because I believe as human beings, there's always moments we can feel hurt, burned, abandoned, treated poorly, marginalized, and it can well into anger. And we're going to talk in a minute about this. Anger, the Bible's clear, anger itself, the feeling of anger is not sin. It's what we do with our anger. We're all going to feel feelings. Some people don't want to acknowledge they have anger because they think, well, that, that makes me a horrible person. No. If you feel anger sometimes, it just means this. You're a human being. It's what you do with it. It's how you deal with it. If you do deal with it. If you don't deal with it, you ignore it. Whatever kind of anger is, it's going to eventually percolate up into some kind of action, attitude, words that are sinful. So the way it could be, if we want to look at what God might do in our lives on this topic, first recognize and name my anger. I have to recognize and go, you know, I, I, some, some of you needs to go, you know, I got, I've got an explosive anger issue and I, if I'm not careful, I'm going to hurt everyone around me. Maybe, maybe not physically, maybe physically, but certainly emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, I'm going to blow my life up. You might say, boy, I, I got that passive aggressive thing. I'm always making little jabs and I kind of step back and no, it wasn't me, you know. But, but to acknowledge, maybe you're, you're wrapping your anger in spiritual stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm just a good Christian, but man, I don't like this person, that person, that person, because I'm so godly and they're not. And be careful. You know, so so name, name your anger, acknowledge it. Listen to the words again of Ephesians 2, 26 and 27. We're going to read this a number of times because I want this passage to get in your ears and to get in your mind and to get in your heart and to get in your soul. I want God to speak to you through his word. In your anger, do not sin. You can be angry, right? In your anger, do not sin. Don't act on that. Don't speak on that. Don't do something that creates sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Don't make room for that spiritual battle that comes when you let anger stay in your soul. So here's a question for you. I want you to ask this question to yourself right now. In your own heart, your own mind, ask this question. What kind of anger comes naturally to my heart and life? Just quiet your heart for a minute. Between, just between you and God, or if you don't believe in God, just think about it for yourself, okay? But what, what, what kind of anger just sort of comes, is it that subtle interior seething anger? Is it that explosive, you know, yelling, screaming, everyone knows I'm angry? Is it spiritual anger? Is it passive aggressive? But just take a moment and say, what, what is the way that anger kind of works its way into your soul, into your heart? And just acknowledge that. For, and if you're a praying kind of person, say, God, I acknowledge that this is a, something in my life I've got to keep an eye on, that that anger wouldn't lead me to sin. The way it could be. Okay, anger is not sin, but it can easily lead to sin. Being angry. If someone treats you bad and it hurts your feelings and you feel angry, that's not sin. How you treat that person can become sin. All right? Looking at something in our world that's unjust is, and you get angry about that injustice, that's, there's, there's something good about that. We should be angry about injustice. How do you handle it? There's certain ways to handle it that would be redemptive and certain ways that are destructive and that don't honor God. So, so understand that, that anger is not sin, but it can easily lead to sin. And so again, listen to these words. Let it soak into your mind. Let it soak into your heart. In your anger, when you deal with anger, do not sin. In your thoughts, in your words, in your actions, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Deal with it. And do not give the devil a foothold. Question to reflect on. What are some of the sinful actions, feelings, and attitudes that can enter my life when anger goes unchecked? This is not the person next to you. 
This is for yourself. Ask yourself right now, what are some of the sinful actions and feelings and attitudes that kind of get in your life when you aren't dealing with your anger? Just quiet your heart for a minute. And just think about your life. Okay, someone treats you bad. And you're hurt, you feel angry because they really treated you bad. How do you respond? Gossip. I'm going to talk to everyone about it. I'm going to tell them what a bad person they are. How this is 100%, 1,000%, 1,000,000% their fault. And I'm so good and sweet and righteous and they're so bad. I'm going to let the world know. How you talk about the person. Apathy. I could care less about that person. I'm done with them. I'm writing them off. They're never going to hear from me again. They are off my social media feed. They are out of my life. You know, I don't care anymore. Revenge. Uh, they'll get theirs. I'll wait. It, it, it may take time, but I'll find my opportunity. I don't know what it is, but, but just to look in your own life and say, when I get angry, how do I respond to it? How do I react? Because it's painful when somebody hurts us, and, and, and that can lead us to becoming very angry. And so, so how do you respond? The way it could be, we've got to deal with anger honestly, quickly, and in a godly way. There are ways to deal with your anger that will keep you from going into sin and giving a foothold for the devil. There are ways, but we have to find the right way forward, and we're going to talk about that. So Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, hear it again. In your anger, I bet you right now if you close your eyes, if I said in your anger, you could probably say, do not sin. You probably got that part already. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So what action can I take when anger is growing into sin? When, when I'm dealing with anger towards a person, towards a circumstance, and it's growing inside of me, and I, I acknowledge, okay, I'm feeling angry, but I'm not blowing up, and I'm not treating people badly, but, but what do I do to keep myself from going down that road? Because listen closely. If you let anger bubble and boil and percolate in your soul long enough, it will come out in some sinful way. If someone's hurt you and you're angry at them, eventually you're talking about them, you're gossiping about them, you're slandering them. But it's true, they deserve it, and you have all the justifications. Right? If you let anger keep in your soul, eventually you're going to physically end up responding in some way or doing something, saying something, acting in some way that doesn't honor God, and then it becomes sin. So what action can I take when anger is growing into sin? Here's, here's something kind of rapid fire, a number of things you can do. When you, feel like you're, you're, when you feel that anger and you're about to act on it, what can you do? Here's some little practical things. Take a walk. If you're in a situation that it's building up, just, just kind of st- pe- kindly step out and just take a little walk. And when you're taking a walk, pray. God, help me. I'm about to lose it. I'm about to say something I shouldn't say. I'm about to do something I shouldn't do. And and talk to God about it. Share with God what you're dealing with. God knows anyways, but ask him for his strength. Ask him for his power. If you're feeling that anger build up, actually, here's a very practical thing you can do. Physiologically, breathe deeply. The more angry you get, sometimes the more it's just like, you almost stop breathing. It's just like building up and you're just going to... It almost, almost, almost it does something, it actually brings oxygen to your brain. It can let your body relax. Just kind of breathe deep. Just, just say, don't, God, don't let this take over. How about this? If you feel anger building up, punch a punching bag or kick a punching bag. I've, our entire married life, I've had a punching bag in my, ba- in my basement when we lived in Michigan, in my garage here. And sometimes a good 10, 15, 20 minutes that's beaten that thing to death, uh, <laughs> punching, kicking, I feel, just feel a lot better afterwards. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm not kidding. This is that. You go, well, why, why would you do that? Sometimes, sometimes I just do it to exercise, but sometimes I'm angry, but I don't want to sin. And last time I checked, punching a punching bag isn't a sin. And it, maybe it's just me, but there's something, something physically about kind of letting it out, all right? Um, learn from Jesus. If, you, if, you, feel, if you, you feel sin growing up and it's going to take you somewhere you shouldn't go, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at the very beginning of the New Testament, which is all the Bible part after Jesus, you know, kind of after it's when Jesus came till he, till he, till he comes again. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John just tell the story of the life of Jesus. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four Gospels. It doesn't take that long to read any of them. And, and read them and just look for one thing. How did Jesus deal with moments he could have gotten angry and exploded? Just look, ask that question when you read through it. Because there were times that people slandered him, treated him badly, lied about him, drove nails into his body. You know, I mean, there's lots of places you read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where Jesus could have gotten angry. And I think probably in some ways because he was a human like us, he probably felt the emotion of anger, but he didn't act on it. You see, Jesus felt the emotion of anger? Well, one time he went into the temple 
And there was this one area in the temple that was reserved for people from all the nations of the world to come and worship God. It's called the court of the Gentiles. It was where anyone could come and worship. And it was so filled with people selling, it had become like a flea market, a swap meet, an outdoor store. And there was no room for anyone to pray or worship. And Jesus was angry. And he cleaned house. He drove everyone out of there. So this is a place for the nations to pray, not a place to have a flea market. And it says that Jesus wasn't like, oh, let's, let's, let's just, he, he was angry, but he didn't sin. He did the right thing. Our key is to make sure that we do the right things when that anger percolates up in our soul. So learn from Jesus. Confess to God. If you're dealing with anger, say, God, I'm dealing with anger. I'm so frustrated right now. I feel like I'm going to lose. I'm going to say this about this person. I'm going to do this thing and just talk to God about it. And we can even confess what we're dealing with to other people who we love and we trust. Man, I'm struggling here. Will you say a prayer for me? We ask, I just feel like I'm gonna lose it and I, I, I'm feeling angry. I, don't, I can't get rid of the fact that I feel angry. I, this, this happened and it's frustrating and it makes me feel angry, but I don't wanna act like this and ask other people to come alongside you and help you. Memorize a Bible passage. If you're feeling anger grow up. Maybe the one that we're looking at right here. These, these two verses in Ephesians 4. Commit them to memory. Some of you, by the end of the service, because I keep reading the passage over and over again, you're gonna go, I almost got it memorized anyways. So just keep on going and get it memorized. And just go over it when you feel anger growing up. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on my anger. Don't give a foothold for the enemy. Get that in your mind. And then go over that when you're feeling that anger kind of grow up inside of you. You want to go to a master's level, you know, kind of 401, highly advanced approach? If you feel yourself, you feel, you feel anger growing up inside of you, and you think you're going to do something you shouldn't do or say something you shouldn't say, here's what you do. Either in your mind, write these down, or on your computer, on your phone, just pull up a little notepad on your phone, and you type in all the possible consequences if you explode and do what you're thinking of doing. I could destroy this relationship. I could lose my job. I could go to jail. I could, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. And just start writing them down. And go, okay, that's, that's what can happen if I let my anger lead me to sin and I do something like this. And the enemy gets old because the enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if he can use anger to do that in you, he'll do it. So maybe look at what are those consequences and be honest about that, right? Get some support. If you're in a small group, let your small group pray for you and encourage you. If you need to talk with a pastor, you're part of Shoreline Church, talk with a pastor. If you need to meet with a professional counselor, a good Christian counselor, we'll connect you with somebody, but get the help you need to deal with that if it's building up inside of you. Talk it through. If you're angry with a person, there's a point where you probably should talk it through. Now, I tell, I tell like married couples, if you have married couples that they, they're dealing with conflict and when they get going on something, if they say, well, we gotta talk this through because I'm really angry about it and it can go louder, ah, 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 get, get really, really intense and kind of explode. Here's what I tell couples to do. I tell them, have that conversation at your favorite restaurant where people know you. <laughs> and you sit down there and you, go, and you go, so honey, I'm really feeling frustrated about this and of course, I love you and you're wonderful. But I, you know, and you, and you, and you, kind of, and you can, it just... It takes some air out of the ball, right? Because you're right there. If you're, sometimes you're, if you're at home alone, some of, you, some of you people have had the same fight over and over again, and if you're in your home, no one's there, and it just tends to escalate, escalate. But when you meet in public, it tends to bring things down. Maybe that would help you, right? But get the help you need. And then the way it could be, recognize the reality of spiritual warfare, where the enemy gets a foothold or foot in the door of your life. Back to the passage again. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Deal with it. And here's the last part. And do not give the devil a foothold. Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give the devil a foot in the door of your life. So, so deal with it now. And if you don't, the devil can get in. And so I remember Sherry and I, and I don't remember if it was right before we got married or early on in our marriage, we made a decision that we would not go to bed when we were still angry at each other. And early on in ministry, three little kids, full-time ministry. I was actually doing my doctoral program and full-time working in the church and three little kids. And Sherry was working for a publisher and raising the kids. And there was just a lot going on. There were times where things got tense at times in our relationship. And that, that happens in all marriages. But for us, we said, well, we're, we're not going to go to bed until we, and we, we decided this is how we would know that we were no longer angry. We agreed that before we went to bed, we would have to kiss each other. <laughs> so if we were dealing with a conflict... It'd be like, you know, talking, we're talking till midnight, we're talking, praying to work it through, and there's still some, and, and, and one of us might say, the other one say, okay, can we kiss yet? No. <laughs> Another half an hour, hour of talking and praying and working through it, and okay, are we ready to kiss yet? Not even close. <laughs> she was not my voice saying that, was, I'd say, but you'll be like, okay, but, but by, you know, we didn't go to bed till five this morning. 
No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> it's not true. But uh, it's not true. Uh, but, but, but we've had our late, late, late nights. And can I tell you, at that point, when you've worked through all that stuff for an hour or two hours and worked through whatever it is, it's not a really good kiss. It's just a quick peck. You know, it's just like a quick... <laughs> It's about all, it's about all, but that's like, but that's, but that's all at that point. That's we, cause that's a way of saying, I still love you. We're still in this thing. We're going to keep pressing forward, but this is tough. We made that decision and we, and we've held to that through the years. We've held to that and held to that and held to that because we don't want the sun to go down on our anger and we don't want to give the devil a foothold in our marriage. In every relationship, I think we need to say, keep short accounts. When those things are building up, don't give room for the enemy to sneak in there. Where is the enemy seeking to slip into your heart, your life, your relationships, or your mind and poison you with anger? Where does the enemy come in and get you just to, just to marinate your soul and your heart in that anger? In that video where Heather shared, she talked about that idea of, yeah, okay, that anger could burn you up, but it also keeps me warm. Sometimes that feeling of anger has become so familiar. It's like one of the one distinctive emotions we feel and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. If there's someone in your life who you're angry at and it's been 10 years since you talked to them and you're still letting that just in your heart and whenever you think of them, it just seeds and bubbles and burns. The enemy's just going, got you. Right where I want you. Feel in your heart. You may have somebody who's passed away. They've been gone for years. But they still have a little apartment well, it's a reserved room in your heart where they still live and dwell because you think about, every time you think about them, it's anger and bitterness and the enemy's got that foothold in your heart. Maybe this is the day you say, no vacancy, man, you're out of here. I gotta move beyond this. There, there may be anger, but I'm not gonna sin and let it taint my heart and taint my life and destroy my relationships and blow up my career and my future. I'm gonna deal with it in a way that honors God. So living the dream, living the dream life, it's developing a whole new outlook and response uh, pattern when it comes to anger. How do I respond to anger? Do I just let it stay in my heart? Do I ignore it? Do I explode? How do I respond? I'm going to give you just a few practical ways to respond when you see that happening in your heart and your life. And maybe for some of you it's a constant challenge, then let these things be a constant part of your life. First, living the dream life, bring prayer into your places of anger. When you're dealing with anger, bring prayer in. Bring it in quickly and bring it in distinctively. Say, bring prayer when I'm angry? Yes. I'm going to give you four different ways to pray when you're angry. They're all from the book of Psalms. There's, there's, there's entire groups of Psalms in the book of Psalms that are built around these kinds of feelings. Because the book of Psalms is actually 150 prayers of God's people. And so one kind of, one kind of prayer that's modeled in the Bible is confession. If you feel anger growing up, God, I, just in your heart, I confess to you, God, I'm so angry, I'm so bitter. I could explode. I could just lose it, God. I confess to you, I need your help, and I'm confessing what's going on. And you just tell God what's in your heart. You say, well, he already knows. Yes, he does, but there's something in that process of confession. Let God know what you're struggling with. Talk to him about it. And if you've blown it and you've blown up, say, God, I'm so sorry. I ask for strength to change. But confess, prayers of confession are powerful when you're dealing with anger. Lament. The lament psalms are the largest, there's more psalms that are psalms of lament in the book of Psalms than any other kind of psalm. And a lament is just a cry out of pain and struggle and heartache of the heart of somebody who is hurting and struggling and yet still holding on to God. So the lament prayer sounds like this. God, that person hurt me. That person betrayed me. That person abandoned me. I am, I'm so angry and I'm so frustrated and I'm so lonely, God, and I feel like I'm in quicksand up to my neck. You feel like you're far away. I need you, God. I'm crying out to you. And yet, God, you're all I have. I, I, I know you. I, I cling to your name. I cling to who you are. But God, this is so hard. That's a prayer of lament. Boy, when you're dealing with anger to come to God and say, this is where it's coming from, God, and this is what I'm going through. If you don't believe those kind of prayers in the Bible, you read the book of Psalms. Just go on, just do a Google search for Psalms of lament. And there's personal laments and community laments. And it's the largest category of Psalms in the whole. Why would God do that? Because there's times we're hurting and we need to bring those things to him. Here's the third kind of prayer you can bring into your places of anger. Imprecatory prayers. Imprecatory prayers. You say, what kind of prayer is that? This is a dangerous prayer, but it's, I think it's a valid prayer. It's in the Bible. There's some precatory prayers in the book of Psalms. It's a prayer where you ask God to deal with the thing you're angry about. So it could be a prayer like this. Maybe, maybe you think about human trafficking and people that are selling, you know, little boys and girls, 
pre-teenage boys and girls to people for physical pleasure. And it just makes you so angry. You could just explode. And you say, God, I'm just praying. Deal with those people. Tear them down. Stop what they're doing. They're evil and it's wrong. And, for, and, and God, for your glory, I pray you, God, I pray, I pray that they would come to know Jesus and repent. And if they won't, God, take them down. Oh, wow. Huh. That's a, it's a dangerous prayer, right? Be careful that you're not so self-righteous that you think all the time you can pray these kind of prayers. I'm so good and righteous, I'm going to pray against the bad people. I'm, you know, that's not the point. But there's, there's, there's prayers. And, and, I, and I, in, in, the, in the Psalms, I believe most of those prayers are like this. God, deal with that person so I won't. It's saying, God, you can deal with that injustice. I can't, but you can but there's prayers when you're angry, when you're hurting, where you, need, where you can say, God, I'm praying that you will deal with it, that you will make, make right what is wrong. You will bring justice to what is unjust in our world. And you can pray that with passion. And if you don't believe me, there, there's, there's psalms that are way more severe than what I just prayed. Way more severe. That's, that's a valid kind of prayer, all right? And then fourth, supplication. A supplication is just asking, God, help me. I'm calling out to you, God. I'm praying you'll help me. I'm praying you'll help this person that I'm sideways with. I'm praying that you'll come in and by your spirit you'll invade and you'll change and you'll transform and you'll work in my heart and my life. I'm asking, a supplication is, is praying, God, help me or help them. Prayer in moments of anger is so, so powerful. If you want to live the dream life, learn to pray your way through the angry times. Living the dream life. Make a plan to deal with it. Most anger comes out of conflict and most conflict comes through relationships. Much of our life's anger comes from a conflict with a person. So how do you deal with somebody who's sinned against you or they've sinned in a way that's harmed you or harmed others? Well, in the book of Matthew, uh, there's this, there's this uh, beautiful story that, uh, where Jesus is teaching his followers and they're dealing with how do you deal with people who have, who have wronged you? So in Matthew chapter 18, Beginning in verse 15, Jesus is teaching and he gives this little four-step process. A four-step process to how to deal with someone, when someone's wronged you, when somebody's sinned, when somebody has hurt you. And I think implied that you're starting to feel you know, angry and bitterness. Instead of following that trail, there's a different way to walk. So here it is. Listen for the four steps, okay, of what Jesus says. Verse 15 of Matthew 18. If your brother or sister sins or sins against you, wrongs you, Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Follow that? Don't tell anybody else, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. And can I tell you, about 90% of the time when you go humbly and talk with somebody about a problem, you can work it out. And if you do, great, you've won them over. But, verse 16, but if they will not listen, here's step two. Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If you try one-on-one to restore the relationship, to heal things, to get past the anger and get back to restoration and peace in that relationship, and it doesn't work, bring a couple more people along with you. Now listen closely. It doesn't mean bring people along to be on your team and to gang up against them. That's not the point. You're bringing other people along to help reconcile and heal because what you want is peace in the relationship and healing. You're not looking to win a battle and beat them to, down. You're looking to establish peace and re- restore the relationship. So that's the second step. <clears throat> if they will not listen, take one or two others along with you so that, every word may, uh, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of one of two or three witnesses. Then the next verse. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. What does that mean? Stand up during the worship service. I got to tell everybody what she did to me. Over there, two rows over, three rows back. Her, that's the one. Yeah, is that what it means? No, no. It means if you're part of a great, healthy, small group and you're having a marriage conflict, you bring it to them to talk and bring godly wisdom. It means if you have a few godly friends that are committed Christians that are part of your church, you go to them and say, I'm trying to, and you get some people to come in and help you work that out. It means if you need to, you go to a pastor and say to the pastor, will you meet with me and this person because I want to restore the relationship and find peace, not because I want to beat them up. That, bring it to the church means you take it within the church in a body of believers and together you seek to find reconciliation and peace in that relationship. And the passage finishes, if they still refuse to listen even to the church, even to those godly Christians who are part of the conversation, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? Most people read that to mean you know, so step one, talk to them. Step one, talk to them one-on-one. And just pull that, put that up on the screen there for me, Nick. Yeah. So step one, talk to them one-on-one, right? 
So we're just going to pop through this real quickly. Go, to the, um, go, go all the way through the passage. Um, there we go. I went, keep going, keep going, keep going. I want to keep going. I should have, there we go. One more. There we go. I want you to notice the process and the purpose. So go to the next one. Um, okay, first, go and seek reconciliation. Just go one-on-one. -on -one. Try to work it out, okay? Second thing, right? Now bring along one or two others to help you in the healing process. That's the goal. Bring people along. Three, tell it to the church. Bring in godly people. Four, Jesus says, this is the nuclear option, right? Okay. Um, he said, okay, now what do, you, what do you do? You treat them like they're a tax collector or a sinner. Now, here's the question. Here's the question. When Jesus says, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector, we think it means now you ignore them, you just leave them behind, you excommunicate them, you dump them, you're done with them, right? But here's the question. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? If you know the Bible, he loved them. He tried to redeem them. He just believed that they didn't yet know him. I think what Jesus is saying is, if somebody won't be restored in a relationship after you've tried personally, you brought others along, you brought godly people from the church along, and they still won't be restored, then just say that what they need is Jesus. Because their heart's so hard. They might know Jesus, but they need Jesus. Because they need their heart softened. There's a journey we can take in restoring relationships and walking from that anger that seethes in our souls. I know people that have carried anger over a relationship for, for decades. And I don't think their anger hurt that other person one bit but the devil got a foothold and poisoned their soul because they couldn't deal with it. And so you've got a great biblical model that Jesus teaches. <clears throat> so know that process and learn that process. And one last thought, <clears throat> one last thought, living the dream life, create distance and be safe. Sometimes we must be extra careful. This is not ungodly, but it's wisdom. There are times when, when in your life there's a, a relationship that's so tense and so, there's so much anger, there's so much conflict that you go, boy, I can't stay really close to this person, at least right now, maybe at all, because it's, it's too explosive or it's too damaging to my soul, to the relationship, and so I need to learn to step back. And we actually, and I want to share with you a resource that we have coming here to Shoreline next month. Gary Thomas, who Gary Thomas is, one of the, I think, one of the top Christian thinkers and writers, I think, on the planet today. He's an amazing guy. He's coming to Shoreline to do a one-evening event on Thursday uh, on September 15th, I'm not sure what day of the week is, and it's $30 a person. I said that the last service, it was free. So them it's free, but you have to pay. No, we're going to tell them. <laughs> it's $30 a person for this event because it's going to come with some, a bunch of resources, but anyone who can't afford the $30, you come anyways. Every, we don't ever say anyone can't come, but if you can pay the 30 that would be great because we need to make sure cover the cost. But this, you know, you know how, we, how we always say, you know, no, 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 it's not, it's not you, it's me, right? Well, this is called, it's not me, it's you. Okay, it's the opposite. And, and here's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about identifying toxic relationships, those kind of relationships that are damaging, and how do you navigate those and even find out how to make the boundaries you need to survive. And, and I think in our world today, things are getting more and more toxic, and this is a more and more helpful thing. And I forget that he wrote a great book that we wrote a study on. The book was called When to Walk Away. When is it the time to go, okay, I need to step back from this? And so Gary Thomas will be here for a one evening event and encourage you. That would be good for anybody, but especially if you're dealing with anybody in your life that you deal with that's kind of toxic and conflict there, this would be a great tool for you to learn from. But I love how the Apostle Paul, he's speaking to the Church of Ephesus, speaking to Shoreline today, to you today, says, okay, anger, we all deal with anger, but in your anger, don't let it lead you to sin. Words you shouldn't speak, thoughts you shouldn't think, things you shouldn't do. You know, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Deal with it. Address it. And don't give the devil a foothold to be in your soul and in your life because of your anger. Jesus, this is our prayer. We can't resolve all anger issues here in a 30-minute sermon. But we pray that you would teach us, oh God, how to recognize our face of anger, to acknowledge what it is, and not let that lead us to sin. Help us have the courage to deal with that anger. And Lord, we pray that the enemy would be driven out of our lives and out of our relationships with no presence and no potential to bring his work into our lives, that we would follow you, Jesus, and you alone. We pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Uh, before I ask you to stand to send you off the word of blessing, I want to give you a couple invitations. One, I'll be teaching a new members class today in 15 minutes uh, here on campus. And so if you want to be part of that class, uh, up on the screen, it's going to say, where are we meeting here in the Pacific Room? And the Pacific Room is over there, the youth room, right? 
That's the Pacific. Youth room, yes, the Pacific room. Okay. And so uh, that's at 1230 today. And if you want to join church or, or learn more about Shoreline Church, come and join me. That's, that's starting in about 15 minutes. Um, if you want prayer for anything at all, we have teams for prayer online. Just call the number you see on the screen or use the email address there and send us your prayers on campus. Just come in here in the worship center on both sides of the worship center. There's teams waiting there to pray for you. So please don't leave here without letting someone pray for you. And if you're new at Shoreline, we give you a warm personal welcome. We're glad you're here. <coughs> I, I don't think it's an accident that God has brought you here today. So we invite you to, uh, uh, if you're new, go to the Connection Center and uh, just learn about Shoreline Church and get a little gift from them. And uh, if you're online, just send the word welcome to the phone number you see right there. Just text it and we will reach out to you and give you a warm welcome uh, personally online. If you're at home, online, or on campus and you're able to stand, please stand with me so I can send you off with a word of blessing. As we close this time together, may you walk in the peace of Jesus and bring his peace everywhere you go. And may you have the courage to see where anger lingers in your soul and the commitment to deal with it now and the joy of seeing the enemy flee and lose a foothold in your life as Jesus takes a greater part in your life. Blessings on you. Walk in this peace and share it with others. Have a great day. We'll see you next Sunday.